Hello, my name is Donette Rains. And I'm of Creek Indian heritage. That's who I am. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about who I am, about my life experiences, and what I bring as a person. My experiences in growing up have been both Indian and deaf. As far as my identity, I grew up in a deaf family. Both my parents were deaf and I looked up to them as role models. Now as far as their own cultural identity, my mother was Native American, but she was involved in the deaf world. My father was white and deaf, and he was very involved in deaf culture. For myself, growing up in the deaf world, it was almost like being born and raised in the deaf club. I grew up going to all the events at the deaf clubs, and my role models, all the deaf adults that I looked up to, were from the deaf world. And that made quite an impact on me. And it's something I can't separate myself from. I have a strong sense of myself as a deaf woman. But throughout my lifetime, people would always remark about my being Indian, and they would talk about how great that was. But it was something that I did not fully identify with or relate to. It was an emptiness that was still within me. As far as being deaf, I had a strong sense of deaf cultural identity and belonging to the deaf culture, but I did not have that strong sense of attachment to my Indian culture, despite my features, my black hair, my facial features, and skin tone obviously showing me as an Indian. But I did not mean that I did not feel an, an affinity for my people. But that is something that I didn't have any way to express because of the oppression that I had experienced. And I'd like to elaborate a bit more about that oppression. I talked a bit earlier about my identity, and I'd like to go into that more in depth at this point. I have received a lot of negative feedback about my native identity throughout my childhood. There wasn't any type of support system for my Indian culture. There was support for my deaf culture, but I didn't receive support for my Indian culture. And it was a search to find my way back home to fill this emptiness, which actually occurred about five years ago. I finally made a decision to go to the Inner Tribal Deaf Council Convention, or IDC, which is a newly formed organization of Indian deaf people that had just been established. I was there at its inception and the reason I went there was for myself. Because there were people who were Indian people and who were deaf as well. And I saw these people carrying themselves with pride identified as Indian people. Here I had identified myself as deaf all my life and these native deaf people identified themselves as Indian and their appearance and the way they carried themselves I was amazed to see men with long braids. 
there was a medicine person who was deaf. And it filled me with a sense of respect for him. And I approached that spiritual leader and asked if we could sit down and spend time together because I wanted to be able to talk to him about the things that I felt. And I also wanted to talk to him about the emptiness I felt inside and how to deal with it. And he said that it would be okay, no problem, and as soon as the other deaf Indian delegates left to go to the parade, I sat there patiently waiting until this medicine person came. And we sat down together and had a conversation that moved me very much. Here was the Indian support that I needed to receive as an Indian person. And here were the other Indian deaf people too. And I got to work with other members of the board as being an elected officer myself and that was an exciting time and I reached out to my peers to have them enrich me with cultural input because of the loss I had had with Indian cultural identity when I grew up. And there were a number of Indians who responded, oh that's fine, we'll be happy to teach you. I'll be glad to teach you. I'll give you Indian Lesson 101. And that was indeed very funny. We went to the powwow and they described the various types of dances to me, explaining that this was traditional dancing and about the different aspects of the ways that we follow. And here I finally had a support system for my identity of who I was as an Indian woman. And I was very proud to be an Indian deaf person. And I do know that I need both identities as a deaf person and as an Indian person. I've changed my priority where I no longer identify myself first as a deaf person but rather as an American Indian and this is the way I am carrying on the traditions of my ancestors and this is something that the Great Spirit has given to me to be able to share with others and this is important. When I was first enrolled in the School for the Deaf as a little child, my mother had made me an Indian dress in the native style. And across the neckline, she had put in silver rickrack, which she also put in rows and in the gathers of the dress and the skirt part of the dress was a turquoise blue. Another Indian dress that she made for me had pictures of Indian people on it with horses and teepees. It was done in the style of Indian art and it was a beautiful dress. My mother would also braid my hair and that's what she did on the first day of school for me. And at that time my hair was down to my waist and she always braided it for me. Now staying at the residential school I wasn't allowed to come home except for the holidays. It was a place we weren't allowed to leave until time for the holidays. Of course, I enjoyed my time there, even though I didn't have any connection to my native culture. Sometimes I wear my hair back in a ponytail, and there was a dormitory supervisor that really hated to brush or comb my hair. She had no patience in getting through the snarls when I would holler out in pain. So one time she gathered my hair back as if she were going to put it in a ponytail and whacked it off with a pair of scissors. And she went so far as to laugh about it, making fun of me, so I wasn't able to have my hair at an even length that the other girls had at that time. 
She had just pulled it and gathered it at the back and chopped it off. This is something I really couldn't get over. And for many years, every time I saw this storm parent, I felt this rage and hate towards her. How could she have presumed to do something like that and ridicule me? It was something that made my mother very angry. This dorm parent hadn't asked for permission from my mother. It was something she just did on her own. And of course my mother was very upset about that. That's an experience that caused me a lot of pain and carried with me for many years. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit more about my childhood at the School for the Deaf. My grandmother came with my mother to visit me from Oklahoma and I was very excited that my grandmother was coming to the School for the Deaf along with my mother and they drove all the way from my parents home it was a three hour drive and they did this because my grandmother wanted to be able to visit the school and this made me very happy to see my grandmother come to the school she was obviously a full blood Indian and she was such a happy person I just loved my grandmother and my mother thought the world of her. The two of them walked side by side and arm in arm. And I really admired them. But my friends had a different attitude. And my friends said, your grandmother stinks. She's dirty. And here I was, stuck between my friends and my grandmother, who I loved. I didn't know what to do. Whether I should take the side of my friends and keep my relationship with them detached from my grandmother, or should I hang on to the relationship with my grandmother and risk and ignore the relationship I had with my friends? And then I decided I should go with my classmates and forget about my grandmother. But then I thought, no, that's not what I should do because I love her. It was very confusing for me. At the School for the Deaf, my friends that I used to hang out, a few of them would say something like, you're dirty. I'd say, what? I mean, I would just be sitting there. And they would see the Indian in me and tell me I was dirty and I needed to go take a bath. They would start pushing me and gesturing that I was dirty and telling me repeatedly that I need to take a bath. And I told them, this is my natural skin color. And they kept pressuring me saying, you need to take a bath because you're dirty. It was a very frustrating and exasperating experience for me. You see a lot of Indian people who wear their clothing with the color black a lot. 
it seems to be a popular color amongst them. One time, I went to the county fair. The crowd was milling around, the Ferris wheel and rides were going, and the people were buying their tickets, and I was looking around, enjoying the fair when I saw four or five black feet, and then again they could have been Shoshone, I'm not really sure, but it was very obvious when I saw them walking through the fairgrounds, the men had their hair down to their waistline with braids, and there was a woman with them, and this really got to me. Here I was no longer distracted by the fair, but rather entranced by this group of natives, who were the same as I was. These were my people and I just watched them. I came alone to the fair without any friends. I stood there watching them. At this time I was 13, maybe 14 years old. So I decided to take a walk behind them following. What I really wanted to do was to get a pencil and a paper and to communicate with them but I didn't have any on me. I wanted to let them know I was Indian too, but I really couldn't deal with this issue that I had of approaching them. I wasn't really sure where my fear came from, but still I felt this bond with these four people who were walking around, enjoying the sights of the fair, taking their time, and enjoying talking to one another. So I just followed behind them, watching and thinking. And finally I left without ever approaching them. I grew up with a lot of negative stereotypes in my school for the deaf about Indian people. You get the same thing from the media, TV, and movies as well. They portray us all in a very bad light, and with all this bad press going on, I felt that it was something I just couldn't come out and identify themself, myself with. I tried to keep a positive frame of mind. Nevertheless, I would see... I would see that many Indian people in the area seemed to wear a lot of black clothing, even the Mexican Indian people as well. But not wanting to identify myself with them, what I did was refuse to wear black clothing, absolutely. But with shoes, I might wear those that were black, but never a top or anything. I didn't want anything to do that emphasized my appearance as an Indian. So at that time, I was thinking I needed to identify myself as an American, as a deaf person. And I do recall buying very colorful clothing all that time, and for many years ne never wearing anything black until my early 20s when I finally bought my first black top. It's kind of an odd feeling to be wearing something black. And at that time, it was a new experience for me. I didn't feel like it affected my identity, though, in any way. I was still who I am, Donette Reigns, and I saw that it didn't have any negative effect on me. There was a deaf teacher at the School for the Deaf, a graduate of Gallaudet that I really looked up to. 
This teacher was a deaf role model for me. And I remember the time that I was in high school that this person was the advisor to the junior NAD and me as president. And we worked well together. But he always liked to joke with me. He was a funny person. And he would tease me about being Indian. And one thing he used to always say is that my face would fit perfectly on a totem pole. And I didn't know how to react to that. But it was a line that he used often. Your face should go on the top of a totem pole. I really didn't like it. But instead of hating the teacher, which I couldn't bring myself to do, I started hating totem poles. At the time, my school for the deaf had gotten together for an end of the year field trip. And we went to a place with hot springs. We all rode there on a school bus and we got to this area. The name of the town was Shoshone, an Indian name, and they had And they had a totem pole there. And when I saw this totem pole, it really got to me. I couldn't bear to look at it. I felt all that pain brought back and I didn't want my face on the totem pole like that. I felt a very strange and negative sensation from being around the totem pole. Later on, I began buying books and reading about Indian people, and it's something I've really gotten into ever since. And I saw a picture of a totem pole, and I began thinking about them. And then one time at an intertribal deaf council meeting, there was an Indian deaf person there who had grown up connected with her culture and were like sisters. And at this conference, we saw a totem pole and she felt a strong connection to it. And she told me about the totem pole. Of course, she didn't know what kind of relationship I'd had with them. But as she explained about it, I began to look at this totem pole and realized that my old feelings of animosity had disappeared and that the feelings were replaced and renewed in an Indian way and I felt connected to what once had been an object of pain for me. After that, I believe it was about two years later, I got together with a man that I'm going together with now. And he was also an Indian deaf person. As we went for a walk, we saw a totem pole, and I looked at it. And he explained to me the significance in the same way that my Indian deaf friend had explained to me two years previously, and how Native people looked at and viewed totem poles. It was something that really inspired me. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my feelings and my true appreciation of being able to share who I am as an Indian deaf person and to share so that you will have some understanding of my identity as Indian and deaf. Thank you. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God.